tips and tricks for classical users. My name is Jill Sorensen. I'm the product support manager here at Music Master, and I'm going to be getting underway in just a moment. But before we do that, just a quick reminder uh, that this is a listen-only webinar. So if you have questions in the go to webinar panel that you have on your screen, there is a question area. You can go ahead and put your questions in there, and we have people standing by ready to answer those questions as we go along. The recording will be made available on our website a little later this afternoon, so if you want to review it again or have any of your other staff members watch the presentation, you'll be able to do that. All of our previous webinars are on the website and available for you, so you might want to take a look at the other topics that are there. And, of course, you'll see the list for the upcoming webinars as well. So with those uh, few introductory comments, we're going to dig in today and talk about classical tips and tricks. By the way, I should mention that normally our webinars go about an hour, but I have so much good stuff for you. We're probably going to go about 90 minutes or so. So we're just going to forge ahead. I'm going to be looking at almost every area of the software today. And the big thing that I want you to remember, remember is that what I'm talking about is going to be ex try to expand your imagination and your thinking about Music Master so you can do that in different ways so you really can take advantage of all the possibilities within the software specifically for classical music. So when we talk about your library, there are certainly many different ways that you can set up your categories. There is no wrong way here. You can set this up however it makes sense for you. In my database, I have high, medium, and low rotation. And you notice I also have the short and long designation. That's for time. So anything below 20 minutes is short. Anything longer than 20 minutes is long. Now, there's still some exceptions to that. I have packeting in my database, and we're going to spend some time talking about packeting today. Uh, I keep my packets all together, which means if I've got three pieces that are short and one that's long, I decided to put that into my short category. They all move together. So you might do it by musical period. I've seen people do time where it's 0 to 4.59 and 5 to 9.59. However you do your categories, doesn't make any really difference as long as you understand that that's a group of music that will rotate at a very specific speed based on how you call for it on your categories, on your clocks, I mean. Now, the one thing that I do think you should have here in your info bar is something that is akin to rotated music. This is a query that's been built uh, so that I can just double click on it and call it my whole library. So if you don't have one like this, I want to show you how to make one of those so you don't have to go through extra steps to call up the categories that you want to see. Now to do that, I'm actually going to make one for my Christmas music because I don't have one for that. So I'm just going to go ahead and select uh, my queries here. I'm going to go to, no, I was in the right place. I'm going to go to dataset library and categories and I'm going to select groups. Now all the ones that I have are already here so I'm going to select a new one and we'll just call it Christmas and after I do that all the check marks go away. I just have to check in to the ones that I want and when I click OK Christmas shows up here. I can make as many of these as I want but the beauty of this is with one double click all of the Christmas music shows up on my screen. Now, at the moment, I actually don't have the category field displayed, so I just add that in. And you'll be able to see there's the T's, and if I come down to the bottom of the screen, there are the U's. So if you have categories that you look at on a regular basis, more than one, rather than having to come to the query box and adding those to the display, set up some category groups so that you can just do a quick double-click and bring those up on your screen. Now I'm going to close that category because I actually want category A on my screen to talk about adding music to your database. Now I've got a display that I've made just for adding pieces. I'm going to load that in and I'm going to go to the Add Songs icon. In this particular case I'm going to add just one piece. going to put it way at the bottom of the list and that's just fine. Now, the King's Consort released a new CD last month that was all the music uh, from the Royal Fireworks and music from the Water Music Suites. 
uh, by handle. And so that's the one I'm going to add to my database here. So I'm going to come into the composer field and start typing handle's name. Now, you notice I didn't have to type very far, and it filled everything in. That's because I've set up this field, and many of my fields, actually, with autocomplete. And I have the autocomplete option engaged here. This is a terrific thing that I hope you're all using, because it will save you not only time, but will make sure that you don't have typos and things like that going on in the database. So. I actually don't want to type all the different titles that are on this particular CD, uh, but what I want to do is just put in the basic information. So I know it's the King's Consort, and I have to type just a little bit of that before I get to it. And Robert King is the conductor, and it was on Hyperion, so I didn't have to go very far at all to uh, get that particular one. And the spy number is oops, a little past there, 55375. Now, that is all the information that I want to fill in on this particular uh, listing. And you notice it's very generic, and that's on purpose. If I now come back up to the Add screen, I'm going to add three more titles. But this time, not only am I going to leave that check mark, I'm going to go to Clone. Clone clones the fields of the song that has the pointer. So when I do that, I automatically get three more copies. Everything has been filled in. I can now go in here and start to type the music for the Royal Fireworks. I can type in the Water Music Suite. Uh, now, of course, Water Music Suite number two is on that CD, so I have to type pretty far to get to there. Uh, same with uh, the Water Music Suite number three that's on that CD. You have to type a little bit more. But because autocomplete's on there, I don't have to type a whole lot of information. And of course, I could come down here and add the, um, the run times in as well, which is way over on the far right-hand side of my screen. Now, there's definitely some information here that I don't really want to have to fill in on a regular basis. For instance, the composer's birth date, death date, what musical period they are, nationality, pronunciations, uh, those kinds of things are not things that I want to be doing on any sort of regular basis. And so I can use the autofill option to do that. So I want to scroll this back over to the left and show you what autofill does for you. This is a screen that's a little bit similar to the show high fields, what you have available to you, what you're going to do. And I've got composer coding here. So if the composer field matches, all of these other fields are going to be filled in with the information already in the database. So you should have your database set up and ready to go and have that, that uh, composer birth date and death date on all the other pieces by the uh, composer in the database and so on. Uh, and then you can go ahead and run it. Now, if I did that right now, it would run it on the song that has the pointer column. I actually want it to run on all four of these. So I'm going to hold down my Shift key and then come into Autofill, select it and run it. And you notice the composer last name filled in. And if I scroll all the way over to the right, and I'll take the blue out of here so you can see that a little better, all this other information filled in. Now, I selected, as I said, those four because I had those in my example. You could have also come up here and clicked on this square, which actually highlights everything, and then done the run as well, and it would have filled it in for all of them that it, it could do that. So autofill, in my case, I have it for that composer, but you notice I also have a couple more for conductor and orchestra for those pronunciations. So I wouldn't have to come in here and run those all at the same, uh, all one, at right, one right after the other. I could actually right-click in here and pull up autofill, and you notice I have an option to run all of the functions at once. So once you have your autofill functions in place, you could actually run these all at one time, fill in all that extra information, the stuff that is never going to change, his birth date, his death date, what musical period he's in. Those things are never going to change for the composer. So we can use autofill to alleviate you having to type that. Even if you had autocomplete on those fields, uh, it still would take you time to do that. No sense in doing that. Autofill helps you out. Now, I understand that you might have some cases where you are uh, maybe still looking at your database and doing some adjustments to it and fixing it. 
So to kind of show you what you might want to do there, I'm just going to delete what I have in that particular field, and I'm just going to type his name again once. So let's say I had just added that piece, and now I've got you know, more pieces that I need to fill in with the same exact information. Control D repeats the field above. So when I do that, it automatically fills in that field. Now, the big thing about Control D is that it also, it always does the field above. So in this particular case, because my cursor is right here, if I do Control D, it's going to repeat the field above, which is blank. So you have to be careful where you do it. Of course, if you make a mistake, it's not a big deal. As long as you stay in library maintenance and don't close it, you can always go to Edit, Undo. And it'll keep going back through all the changes. Control D, I think, is uh, terrific if you are looking at your titles or composer names, anything where you're going to have a, a list where you see the same thing and you want it to be the same. I've seen a lot of databases where it might say orchestral suite, pound sign two, and also say NO period two. So if you want it to all be the same, Control D is a great way to do that. You can sort your library by whatever column you're working on and run down that column using Control D to make those changes. Now, of course, typing in the information, that's but I also want to let you know that we have an option that will allow you to pop the CD into the machine and just suck in the metadata. So I put an oldie but goodie here into my CD player. Uh, it's the Mozart Collection by John Rutter in the uh, city of London Symphonia. It's an oldie but a goodie. And the trick is to go to the setup screen and change your audio file format from whatever it says down to metadata. And in this case, I'm only going to uh, rip one track just so you can see how that would work. So it's going gonna, it's gonna to rip that track. And then I have all the information here. Lots of fields. And if you don't, you know, if you don't need all the ripping information, just the runtime, the track number, you can space these out and look at them. Uh, now you just come down here and you say, what do I want? So the target is artist. Uh, so at that point, um, I can come in and say, well, I needed to go to the composer field. And uh, the source is artist. And you can go down and you can go ahead and pick as many of these fields as you want. Now, I still may have to come in and make some adjustments, but at least the majority of the metadata would be done and into the program for you. So I come in here. I'll just do a couple of these. Title would be title for me. And I'll pull runtime as well. By the way, I'm not using the drop down there. I'm just typing the letters. I just typed RU, and it, it went down the list and got to the right thing. So there it is. And I'll import that really quick, the one song. It's been added to my library. And it goes into uncategorized. And there it is. Now, again, at that point, I may probably have to come in here and change that and make sure that it says Wolfgang Mozart instead. Uh, and, and go and do any other kinds of things I want and probably move it to the category I want. But at least you would not have to type all of the information. Um, uh, clearly, what metadata is available is going to change depending on the record company and what they provide you. But it would be a way to speed up your process as far as handling uh, the data entry um, process as you're doing uh, things in, in your system. So let me go back to the um, category that we were in when I was adding the handle work. I uh, want to talk a little bit about the keyword fields. Uh, my keyword field for composer allows me to do the control so that I can put that test on. And I have another one over here for title keywords. And title keywords, really interesting. What you put here is entirely up to you. But what you have to remember is that you need to be consistent. So I've got the Goldberg variations here at the top of the screen. And you can see that that is the title keyword on all of these uh, listings. But if I go back and look at the title, you'll be able to see as I change my select sizes here. But I've got different performances, different parts of the Goldberg variations. But what I want to make sure happens is that if, no matter what portion of that I play, as soon as I do, we wait some time before we play another portion of it. But you have to be careful when you're thinking about that. This works really great if it's Goldberg variations, but if it's symphony number one, that's going to be a little problematic. So you might have to put something else in the title keyword to differentiate it. 
uh, what I typically do is put the title and a colon and the composer's name, last name, so that I know what it's different. The, the Four Seasons is a perfect example of that. Uh, you can't just put Four Seasons on all of the Four Seasons uh, because you might have the Mendelssohn version and the Vivaldi version. Also, I want you to think about uh, the different movements that you might have. So the Four Seasons by Vivaldi is a great example of that. I, I bet most of you play the four individual seasons as well as playing the whole work. In a case like that, if you, want to, if you don't want to have spring show up very close to the whole work or autumn or summer or winter, then we need to have something on it that will control that. And that's what the title keyword does. So no matter whether it's one of the individual four seasons or the whole work, if you put four seasons, Vivaldi, on as the title keyword, you've now protected it. And even better, what you've done is you've also set it up in such a way so that when you look at a history graph, you'll be able to see all those performances. So I'm clicked on here, and if I open up my history graph, I am looking at the title keyword, Goldberg Variations. So no matter which portion I played, no matter which one of these I played, this is the history graph. Now that one that I'm actually on, the one that actually has that pointer column, I scroll, I move the, this up and dock it. This particular performance, that's this play history. How did I do that? It's that icon on your screen. And what it does is it highlights the performance that you're actually on. So now I can see any time I played anything that I have Goldberg variations on as the title keyword, but I can still also find that specific performance. If I wanted to, I could certainly come in here and look at that specific performance. Uh, but the box helps me do that. Once you set up your history graph the way you'd like it, I would very much encourage you to use the push pin because that will set the default graph for you so that uh, every time you come into the history graph, it looks that way. Now, you've got title keywords. And if I scroll back over here, you'll notice I also have a packet. They have different names. This sometimes is confusing, especially for classical users, because they think they might do one or the other. And I would like to suggest that you do both, because there, is, there are two different things going on. When you talk about title keyword, it's, just, it's a separation. It's like what you're doing with your composer. You want to wait X amount of time before it comes back up again. With your packeting, what you're doing is you're saying all of these things are grouped together as far as the program is concerned, and that means that they're, they are going to play less often individually. Let me give you a real simple example. Let's say we had a category that had 100 pieces in it, and we had five selections in a packet. The way to do the quick math is um, to take the turnover of the category and multiply it by the number of songs in the packet. So let's say that category of 100 songs actually turned over in 100 hours. So 100 times 5 means the individual elements within that packet will turn over in 500 hours. Every 500 hours, we would be expected to have up for consideration play one of those elements in the packet. The packet itself will come up every 100 hours. So title keywords are saying X amount of time has to go by before we, we play this. But these would all be considered individually if they weren't in a packet. So I'm not only saying let's keep them uh, together in the packet and not play anything too often, but I've got the title keyword separation so that it, the whole thing doesn't play too often as well. Now with the packet, you've got different things that you can do here. And I'm just going to click on the Edit Helper button and pull up this particular packet. You can see that I've got the Keep Packet Together checked off. That's why I, if I move any of these things, uh, they will all move together. If I decided that, that, that this particular, if I clicked on one of these and moved it to a different category, all 15 would go. That keeps everything together as I move it throughout my database. In this case, it looks like everything is below 20 minutes. Uh, that's kind of unusual in, in a lot of my packets. I have lots of stuff that's uh, a little mixture of both. It's probably fairly common that you have this kind of packet, a standard packet. That means when it comes up for consideration, this is the one that's going to get looked at by the scheduler if you're automatically scheduling. 
if it doesn't meet your rules, then it goes on to the next piece on the list. It doesn't go down into the packet. That's where you can use one of the other choices available here. A diggable packet would allow you to set a search depth on this packet, which means if this one doesn't qualify, doesn't meet the rules, now it can go down and look at however many you may set there. So if I say three, now it can go down that far into the, into the packet looking for one that meets your rules. If you really want to get slick with it, though, for classical users, I think weighted is the cool way to go. Here's why. We all know you've got 15 copies of this, 10 copies of that, 7 copies of this. But you guys are all really good. I know. I've spoken to many of you. You know your music. And you know which performances are the best. And once you know which performances are the best, you want to play them more often for your audience. And that's what waiting does. Waiting lets you come in here and say, that's the one I want to play more often. And so that one's going to play twice as much as the rest of these. And so you can come in here and add the number and the weight. The higher the weight, the more often it's going to play in relation to everything else. So this would allow you to not only have all of those performances in your database, but not have to wait, say, that 500 hours in my example that I used to have that good one come up again. If you want that good one to come up every couple of hundred hours, then you can change the weighting here to do that. Now, I hope you're a little excited about weighted packets, because I think it's terrific for classical music. But I do want to make this one note. As I was preparing our presentation today, I actually found something that wasn't quite working the way I would have liked it in the weighted packet area. So that's been corrected and will be available when we release 4.0 SR16. So if you're thinking you want to try weighted packets, uh, watch Check for Updates, watch your monthly newsletter. When you see SR16 is available, get that one installed and then go ahead and work on weighted packets. All right, there's a couple of other things that I want to show you in library maintenance. I am, see, I tried to ex uh, close this out and I hadn't saved my changes. It's a nice feature in Music Master, prevents you from losing your work. I actually don't want to save that change. I was only doing that as an example for you. A couple of other things that I want to show you here as far as manipulating your music and putting things in rotation and out of rotation. Uh, if there is a selection, I'm going to scroll back all the way over here. If there's a selection that I want to cherry pick and say I want to take this one out of rotation for a little bit, maybe put another one in, whatever, you can go to library. Uh, I was in the wrong place. Data sets. No, was I in the right place? I was in the right place. I'm sorry. Library and auto move. This lets me go in and decide where I'm going to move this selection. And I can see what it is, what category I'm going to move it to, uh, and on what date, and I can pick that date. I also have the option to bring it back. This is really good if you want to cherry pick. In other words, you know there are specific things in your database that you want to move in and out. Given the size of your database, I'm not sure that's the best way to go. It certainly is an option, but there's another way that you can actually move some music in and out. And that is through Auto Platoon. Now, in order to show this to you and do this correctly. I'm actually going to click on just a chunk of this music and I'm going to move it into the rest category. So we're going to let that process. Now while it's doing that for just a moment, what I'm going to tell you is what Auto Platoon does. Auto Platoon is a way for you to tell Music Master on whatever schedule you would like to move either a certain number of performances and pieces, say 25, 50, 100, or a certain percentage of your performances to a different category. And then as the schedule runs, what happens is some of the work goes in and some of the work goes out. So now I have a bunch of music in the rest category, and that's really the first thing you have to do when you're thinking about doing platoon. You have to decide, okay, this is the chunk that I want to move. This is the chunk that I want to rest for the moment. And then you can come in to data set, schedule, Auto platoon. You can add as many of these as you want. And so when I click Add, I'll come down to the rest category. Now, I've got X number of pieces in both of these, these places. So I'm going to say I want to 
move 100 titles. I'm going to get to the filter in a moment, but let me show you the schedule. This is just too cool. How would you like to do your schedule? It's pretty slick. Do you want to do it every week, every other week, on Wednesday? Do you want to do it on the 17th every other month? You've got a lot of choices here, month by day. I want to do it on the second Friday of every month. Um, you've got a lot of choices here on how you would move this music in and out. So I'm going to pick um, every Thursday. So once a week, we're going to move some music in and out. So that's my schedule. And then what the program lets me do is hit analysis. And now you can see what happens. It tells me how many songs are in that primary category. That's A. How many songs are available in the secondary category? That's my R. And I'm moving 100 every time. So that means for one piece to go out and come back in, a couple of months. For the whole category to go out and come back in, eh, about three, four months. Well, that would be four months, right? Four months. So what this allows me to do is to keep moving music through my database. Now, why would you want to do this? Well, let me give you two examples of why. First of all, your classical music likers who listen to your station are probably not going to notice that you're doing this because you're still going to be playing quality music throughout your day. Your classical music lovers, though, your core audience is going to understand and, and realize that you're playing this huge repertoire and you're really digging into your library because they are the ones that are going to recognize the pieces that you play. So if they don't hear that piece all that often, then they are going to realize that, wow, they are playing a lot of different music. Now, we can take that one step further. Maybe you've got all 108 symphonies by Haydn or a good chunk of Vivaldi's violin concertos in your database. Let's go back to your classic music liker. The classical music liker probably isn't going to be able to differentiate them. Maybe we'll know it's a Haydn symphony, but you know, doesn't really care that if that one's 101 and that one's 108. Same with the violin concertos. They, okay, that's a violin concerto by Vivaldi. They're not going to get hung up over the RV number. But your core, your core is going to know which ones you're playing. So how about doing a filter where you filter it and say, okay, of this chunk of music, only look for Haydn symphonies and move a chunk of those out. Or only look for Vivaldi work and move a chunk of that out. At any given time, you're playing the Vivaldi violin concertos, but you're playing a subset. And then on whatever schedule you pick, whatever amount you pick, some go out and some go in. Your classical music liker just goes, oh, we're playing Vivaldi violin concertos. I like those. But your core listener, your, 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 your core listener goes, oh, they're playing that one. I haven't heard that one in a really long time. So the filter and platooning allow you to dig a little deeper into your library, maintain your overall sound, but give you that extra variety without having to wait those long rotation times. Keep in mind, you have such a large library that it could be months and months and months if you left all of these pieces in one category. It could be months and months, and it's not you know, it, you know, unimaginable to think that it might take a whole year to rotate through a category. Platooning allows you to make that category smaller, so that means it rotates a little faster. In this case, we saw about uh, four months for it to go through that category, come in and out. And so what happens is you get to hear that music, your different parts of your audience hear it, and then we move it out and rest it for a little bit. Not a very long time. In this case, it was about two months. And then it comes back again, enough to give you a nice variety and give your audience that oh, wow effect. Haven't heard that one in a long time. Again, you can have as many of these as you'd like. Before we leave library maintenance, I want to talk about one other thing here, and that's queries. I've got several queries that I've made here, and they're what we call prompted queries. So that means when I double click on it, I get this box that pops up. And that means I can actually type Mozart, and I'll get all the Mozart music in my database. Now, do I get Leopold? You bet. I get Franz as well because I did that in a way that gave me more than what I wanted. If I did it again and did Wolfgang, I actually still get more than what I want because I've got Korngold in my database. And so what happens is I get his music as well. 
I would like you to make a query that looks for the stuff that you most are concerned about when you're looking for stuff in your schedule editor because all of these queries are available in the editor. So for instance, I'm going to show you how this runtime one is going to help you dial in and find exactly the length of music that you want. So how do we do it? You go ahead and right click and select new query. Up pops the box and I'm just going to delete all everything here. You pick what categories you want and then you come in and you pick the field. Now you want it to be the contains mode when you do that. Um, so when you're looking at this, um, it's finding, you don't have to type the whole thing. In other words, we're not looking for an exact match. You're just saying contains whatever words and letters that you put in there. The trick to the, the uh, prompted query is at prompt. That's what gets it going. And then once I do the left parenthesis, everything I put in after that is what shows up in that query box. So when I did the first time, you may or may not have noticed it was in uh, mixed case letters. I'll do this one in all caps so you can see that. And I go ahead and add. And I'm going to come down here and pick title, and I'll do the same thing. At prompt, title. Now if I wanted to, I can have it sorted any particular way I want. And I'll go ahead and save that. Do save as. Uh, we'll call this webinar query. Now when I go ahead and run this, there they are in all caps. And again, these will show up. These certainly are available in library maintenance or just off your info bar. Uh, but the big key is going to be uh, when we get over to the schedule editor. And I'm going to show you how to use these to call up your library uh, to find specifically what you're looking for. In other words, save you time looking for uh, music in your uh, schedule editor. All right, so we've gone through library maintenance. I want to take a couple of minutes and talk to you about some of the things in clocks. In my clocks, I've got uh, a couple of sets of things going on here. I, I've got my All Things Considered in my Morning Edition clock, and I also have some fixed versions of my clocks migrating as well as holiday, and I even have the fun drive clock. Now, the clock that I use the majority of the time is this one. So I'm going to call this one up and show it to you. This is what we call a migrating clock. All eight of my music categories are called for here. So what I'm telling Music Master is to go pick from one of those, and then I give it this criteria. And what this does is it allows me to get a, a mixture in my database when it schedules, but I never get the same kind of hour every time. Versus if I had that fixed clock, what that one does for me is that one will always give me the A, always give me the D, always give me the I, always give me the B. So if I wanted to call for the other categories, I'd have to have other clocks or do other kinds of elements. So that's why I like the migrating, because all I have to do is give Music Master some parameters, and that's what this bottom section does. So I'm telling Music Master that Honestly, I don't have to have any one of these categories in the hour, but once I do have one of the categories, I only get to play one. So I'm never going to have two A's in my hour, unless, of course, as the person behind the keyboard, I decide I want to do that. I can always break my own rules. Uh, I have nothing in the sweep because I have no sweep markers, for one, but I'm going music talk, music talk, so that doesn't really do anything for me. And then I've got minimum separation of five, and you go, oh, wait a second. There's only four positions in the hour. What does that do for you? Well, I actually call for this clock back to back to back in many, many hours. So think about that. If this position got filled in with the A, we're going to go one, two, three, four, five positions before we can play another A. Basically what I've done by making minimum separation of five is spread out those A's, spread out those B's. All my categories are spread out. And because this is really the same category, I've just divided it by time. I'm saying don't play the A's and B's back to each other. Don't play the D's and C's back to each other. It's really the same category. So when I do that, what I end up getting is this nice variety in my hours. Sometimes I get an A, sometimes I get a B. Sometimes I get an H, sometimes I get a D. It's always mixed up and different. The other thing I have going on in this clock is the timing marker. It's one of the options available to you uh, as an element type. And this particular hour timing is fairly generous, 59 to 60. What I'm basically asking the computer to do when it schedules the music is to get me an hour that's between that time frame. 
And this is a fairly simple thing that a classical library can do, simply because you've got the inventory. You've got a huge library, and even if it picked a longer piece in one position and a shorter piece in another position, the program is able to, to make those compensations and still deliver an hour that's between, in my case, 59 and 60. You can make that whatever you would like. Clearly, the, the shorter and the smaller the tolerance, the more difficult you're making it for the program. But I'm being a little lenient here and saying, you know, give, me a, give me a minute at the top of the hour. And the program then does those calculations for us. Now, that particular calculation uh, can be uh, modified just a little bit. And that's because this is a test. If I open up the rule tree, and show you format clock rules. There's clock hour timing. That's a test, and I have it turned on in my database. It's, a, uh, it's in a rule group, and the rule is sitting there, so that when the log is automatically scheduled, that rule is adhered to. But we can, you know, there's a tolerance to that rule. How big is that tolerance? Music Master is always looking for pieces that fit that time frame, but we can give it some slack on that time frame, and that's done under tools and options. And when Tools and Options pops up, we are going to go down to Additional Properties. And the very last one on the list, if I recall, yeah, the very last one on the list is Timing Tolerance. Now, that's a number in seconds, and I've set mine to the absolute maximum. So what I'm doing is I'm giving Music Master more leeway in trying to fill the positions to meet my timing rules. Um, I will tell you that when, when we first added this particular feature to the software and I was working on it in my database, I was amazed, even though I had a minute of timing for my timing rule, as soon as I upped my timing tolerance, uh, I noticed a distinct change in the way my log was created because it was starting to select pieces that before the program wouldn't pick because they didn't meet the timing requirements. Because I changed that tolerance, it was able to pick those pieces. And it was picking pieces that I hadn't played in a while. And that was terrific. I really liked that, you know, give it this just a little bit more room, a little bit more wiggle room. And then uh, that timing rule uh, went in and still gave me that hour of music, but was able to find other selections that worked. Uh, and so we weren't relying on the same pieces all the time. So tools, options, additional properties, and timing tolerance. Now, if I go back to the clock, I'll go to this one. Um, it's spring. You might have finished your fun drive already. Be thinking about doing one. I have to wonder if there's a particular subset of music that you play during your fun drive. I know everyone does it. We just don't like to admit it. You play the War Horses, those really popular pieces, those kinds of things. Uh, how do you get those to schedule automatically? Well, there's a couple of ways you might do it. First of all, you probably need a field in your database that takes care of that. Now, that could just be a, an attribute field, like, say, a, a coding field that you have in your database where you do that. Uh, I actually set up a field in my database called FunDrive, and it's just a checkbox field, yes, no. If I check it off, that means that's a piece I want to play during the FunDrive. Um, once you have your data coded, and remember, this is not something that you have to do now all at once. You know, when you're generating tomorrow's log, and you go, well, that's a piece that you know, we would normally play during a fun drive. Add the code. So you can do this as you go along, and this doesn't be, have to become some big project. And then what you can do is come into your filter. And again, in my case, I have that fun drive field. Now, mine's a checkbox field, so that's why my only ads, uh, options are is true or false. So I say that's true, and it's clock filter 1. This is another test. So I have to come back to the rule tree if I'm going to do that, and turn on Format Clock Filter 1. But then at that point, if that's an unbreakable rule, this position is only going to be filled in by something that has a check mark in that field. Again, making the program do the work for you. And of course, we could set up a prompted query to do the same thing. We could say, hey, I want something in that field. Great. Or you know, maybe you make an attribute code that's F for fun drive. Uh, we can make a, a query that does that too. So even if you don't automatically schedule, it's not a problem. We can still set up things within the program so that you can call for that stuff quickly. Of course, once you have 
your clocks set up, the question is always how do we get those scheduled? And I know some of you may have gone in here and gone to the assignment grid and actually made an assignment grid specifically for, you know, this spring's fun drive or you make one for the fall fun drive and you, you clone what you have and you just go in and you change those clocks and those individual hours. You know what? That's way too much work. We're not going to do that. No, no, no. I want you to go ahead and create a grid that has all of your clocks in it for your fun drive. So I still have my morning edition. I still have my all things considered. But every other clock you see here is my fun drive clock, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And I do that on purpose because then I can come in and use the format scheduler. The format scheduler is a way for you to come in and either pick in, in one of several ways what clocks you want at a particular time. So the development director walks down the hall and he says, we're starting the fun drive tomorrow at 3 o'clock. You go, okay. Tomorrow at 3 o'clock. So I come in here and I pick the clock. As soon as it does that, it gives it the little indication. And I'm just going to click off the 7th so that you can see. There's a change there. That's why it's yellow. So I can sit here and now cherry pick and go through. So if the fun drive starts in the middle of the day, not a problem. Just come into the day, pick the clocks that you need, put them in there. You're done with that day. If this whole day is a fun drive, right click on it assign a specific grid to this date and we're going to pick that fun drive grid we're all taken care of see what happened those are all the same things we saw there what if this whole week is the fun drive right click assign to the week and pick that grid and we're all set just like that i've got it all done so you know no matter when you get that email that says this is when we do our fun drive you can come in pick your month go in set that up you're all taken care of you're done it's one of the few places in the program you have to hit save. Of course, if I try to close this and don't do that, uh, it will warn me. So I can come in, hit save, and then, of course, I can close it, and I'm all set. If I open up those logs or do any manually scheduling, uh, do any automatic scheduling, those clocks are in there, and I'm all set and ready to go. Don't have to worry about it anymore. So let me close a couple of these things here. Of course, there it is. I tried to close it, and I hadn't saved it, so we'll go ahead and save that. I want to get back here to the rule tree and talk a little bit about what's going on in the rules and how we can get this set up. And again, it doesn't matter if you don't automatically schedule. You still should have a rule tree because you guys know the music. You don't need to worry about when was the last time you played a composer, when was the last time you played a harpsichord work. You don't need to keep track of those things. That's what the computer is really good at. So we want to set up some rules so the program does that. So let's talk about a couple of things. First of all, let me tell you a little bit about what I've got going on here. I've got most of my rules in my all category folders. I've got just a few rules in my individual folders, and that's mostly my minimum rest. And that is because every category rotates at a different speed. Minimum rest, clearly a big rule that you should have, and I'll talk about that in just a second. So the first thing that you'll notice if you, you start looking at this list is that I've got the same rules in more than once. So there's composer keyword separation, and there's composer keyword separation. There's shift rotation, and there's shift rotation. What am I doing? It's called scaling the rule. What I'm telling the program is that I absolutely positively have to have six days, nine hours, 25 minutes worth of separation. But what I really want is nine days. And so what happens is as the program considers that music, it's going to find everything that meets that six-day number and passes those on. And then it's going to do another test and go, well, do any of these things that pass six pass nine? I've seen people scale this a lot, two, three, four, five times, depending on what their format is. Two I thought was a nice way to start in my classical database. If I felt like I could go more, I could add another breakable folder. I could add another rule folder. And... Uh, get myself a breakable two folder and keep doing this and basically it's it's doing a little bit of thinking for you in the sense that if you sat there and were looking at that piece and said well there's one that's rested six days but here's one that's rested nine that's the one you might play more likely anyway uh, so that's what's going on with the scaling because what I'm saying is this is the floor I have to have this but this is what I really want uh, I've got some other things going on here that I'm going to talk about as I go through the, uh, the, the kinds of uh, rules that are available that uh, can really help classical stations. 
uh, you've got such a huge inventory uh, that playing something that hasn't played for a long time uh, can sometimes be a real key to what you're doing in your log. Uh, if you automatically schedule, the optimum song rest is something that you can use to have the program do that calculation automatically. Now the first time you drag this over, you get this nice little information window. Basically what it says is that we're going to search through your whole category based on your search step. So this is probably going to take a little longer. But the end result is that you get a better log and you spend less time editing it. So what happens is it goes through all the rules and it has this chunk of music that basically all sort of has the same value. Uh, they all test equally well. So now we've got this big pool of music that tests equally well. What's our tiebreaker? Our tiebreaker is song rest. So I've got this pool of music. Which one of these pieces has rested the most? That's the one that Music Master will put into your schedule for you. So you can see that we've got lots of different uh, scheduling goals available to you. Uh, they all do something different to get you that best selection. If you put more than one into a folder, it's going to look at both of those goals, or those three goals, or four goals, and say, OK, based on these four, what's the best piece? So when you look at something like hour exposure, how many of the other 23 hours of the day did it play in? You look at something like keyword rest for the composer. Which composer has rested the most? That's the one that goes into the program, uh, into the schedule, I should say. Now, when you look at song history rules, minimum rest is certainly the big one that I would highly recommend you all have in your database uh, because that's going to prevent something from playing too often. And again, given the size of your libraries, uh, you should have this rule in place because you have so much stuff that we want to make sure that we play it. And one of the ways you can do that is to make sure that other pieces aren't playing too quickly. And that's what the minimum rest rule does for you. Uh, you can run the wizard here, which will look at calculations and actually give you a suggested setting. There's also a suggested setting available under the turnover analysis screen as well. Now, the text field rules, and I, by the way, I suppose I should mention, you may or may not have a plus sign next to something. That doesn't mean you don't have any text field rules. It just means you don't have any with tests turned on for them. Uh, I've got a couple of them in my uh, database. Uh, but the one I don't have is the one actually that I wanted to suggest to you. Uh, and that is spine number. How many of you have the music library where the, the announcer still goes to the library and pulls the CD off the shelf? In other words, you don't have it on the hard drive. So if you're in that boat, like I was, the announcer comes into the, my office and says, Jill, that CD's not on the shelf. And I go, OK. And I go to Music Master. And I find him something different, and off they go. So the log comes back the next day, and I look at it and go, oh, yeah, that's not in there. I've got to go see what's going on with that. And I pop into the library, and sure enough, it's on the shelf. Why? Because the previous announcer shift had to use the same CD. So a really cool thing you can do with a text field rule, if you have one available, uh, and if you need one, talk to your music scheduling consultant. Um, do a test on your spine number field or your ascension number, however you catalog that music, and say, hey, 24 hours has to go by before we play that again. Might have to take that rule out of play at Christmas because there's so many different selections on a CD, but you could prevent that CD from playing more than once. My database with all things considered in music, uh, uh, let's see, all things considered in Morning Edition in it, I think I play about 70 titles a day. Uh, and that's including the overnight. You might actually have an overnight service. So you're not playing that many CDs in a day, so shouldn't be a problem to only play the CD once in a day. So text field rule would let you do that separation. Of course, I have conductor, orchestra, and soloist here, so if I wanted to make sure that those, those uh, people and organizations don't play too close to each other, I can do that. The keyword field rules is where we had, where I was talking about the composer separation. Now, the one thing I, I kind of just glossed over real quick, because I wanted to have you think about it for a moment, uh, was, well, shoot, six days, nine days. There's no way she can have Mozart wait that long. And you know what? You're absolutely right. In fact, in my database, Mozart doesn't wait, you know, not even two hours. Uh, and that's because I did something really cool. I went to the keyword editor. And I'll pop all my composers, and I've got almost 800. And you notice that in several of them, they have very specific times. My rule is set up to use the auto setting unless there's a specific time on it. And so here is the cool trick for you. Come in here and go to the separation wizard. 
and you'll be in the composer field and click next. So I said six days, nine hours, 25 minutes. How did I come up with six days, nine hours, 25 minutes? It's completely random, but it's oddly random in the sense that six is not divisible by 28 days in the month, 30 or 31. Nine hours isn't divisible into 24 hours, and 25 minutes isn't divisible into 60 minutes. In other words, if I actually played something every six days, nine hours, and 25 minutes, it's unlikely that anyone would find the pattern. And then I asked the program to go calculate. How many, how many keywords can do that? And in fact, I actually did it for the nine days, too. Uh, and it's kind of fun if you go ahead and do this for a large time. Because what it will do is tell you how many we should change. And I'm just going to change that setting for the moment and click Finish. Up it pops, and it shows me the changes in blue. I'm actually just going to filter the list so I only see the changes. And you can see some of these are very close, so I might not go ahead and change those. And you can see I can just change them individually depending on where my pointer is or go through. What I like about this is that what you end up finding is that you can play composers, uh, have much more space between the plays of composers than you really thought. And every, every format has its one-hit wonders, and so does classical. You might not have very many um, pieces by a particular uh, composer in your database. Uh, so you don't want to play those too often or too close together versus somebody like Mozart, who I've got a lot of work, and so I would expect it to come up more often. So I can come in here and change any of these. I can change them all uh, to get the best separation as I'm running my database. Now, if I go to, I would suggest you do this for your title keywords as well, uh, so you can get the best separation on those uh, also. Now, I'm just going to click Done here and close this uh, so that I can show you the separation here. I've just sorted it by my separation column. And I'm going to come down, and about 75% of the way down the list, we're going to find Mozart. So I want you to think about what I just did here because it's really cool. I have about 800 keywords, and what am I? I'm, I'm a little more, I'm around 75, maybe 80% down my list before I get to the first one that can't meet that big old auto setting. In my case, that's six days. And you can see I've got ones that are seven and eight as well. So that means fully 75% of my composers can all meet six days, nine hours, and 25 minutes. Again, you've got a huge inventory. Let's spread it out. Let's make sure that, yes, we're playing Mozart and Beethoven and Haydn and Brahms and all those big guys as often as you would expect to play them. But for the people that we only have one or two performances or one, we're not playing them very often. We're mixing up that rotation. Uh, when you come in and do the wizard, uh, sometimes it's fun just to go in and hold number. Uh, you know, I mean a big number, you know, pick something, you know, in the double digit of days. Look how many keywords you have before you start, and then notice how many it changed. You know, if 50% if of them don't change, it's like, wow, that means 50% of my keywords could meet that rule. How far can you go? How much separation can you get when you're doing this? I love that keyword wizard. That really helps out the classical guys. All righty. Attributes. This is where you have the control over your sound. The, the database is going to reflect the coding that you've put in. I don't have anything really unusual here. I've got musical period. It's got the ones you would expect. I realized yesterday I don't have 21st century on my list, though, so I'm going to need to add that one to my list. Uh, instrumentation is one that I do want to point out to you uh, because if you look at this really closely, you'll actually see some things that really aren't instrumentation. I think of instrumentation as what instrument in the orchestra is playing the work. Uh, so that wouldn't really be Baroque Orchestra or Christmas. And so that's why I've added a new field to my database that I'll start to populate. It's called form. So this will be what is the, the form of the, the ensemble that is playing. And you say, you know, don't have to do this, but why would you? Well, the idea when you're doing data entry is that you can put in that code that makes sense. S is solo. Uh, I know if I'm in the form field, D is duet. Uh, but if I'm in the instrumentation field, S might just stand for strings. So having separate fields for different coding uh, allows you to keep those things distinct and allows you to not have to run out of codes and you know, maybe pick something silly here uh, where you know, the code doesn't make a whole lot of sense to you. I've seen that happen. 
and what invariably I see is that the user will go, S is for strings, even though S isn't for strings. Uh, they make that connection, so that's why I've added a new field to my database. And again, anything that I'm talking about here in the rule tree, uh, things that you know you want to do that you might not have fields available for, call your music scheduling consultant. They will be able to help you get the fields you need added to your database so you can take advantage of some of this stuff. Once I have all these rules, uh, I'm sorry, once I have all these codes in my system, I've actually gone ahead and put some rules in. And nationality is the fun one that I like to show everybody uh, because it's a very subtle thing. Um, it took me a long time to do all that coding. Uh, but now that I have it in my system, I can actually, you know, you know I play four pieces an hour from that clock. Basically, I'm pretty much saying, unless you're Austrian, German, or Italian, gosh, no surprises there, right? Uh, we're only going to play one nationality. We're not going to play the same nationality twice in an hour. And again, it's a very subtle thing, but it allows me to dig deeper into my library and, and take advantage of all that music that I do have available to me. I did mention it briefly because I talked about the fun drive, so I will show you those yes-no rules. They're just check boxes, but then I can do things like have time separation and quotas. You notice I have one that if it's a vocal piece, I can check it off. Local is a nice addition. If you don't do uh, something that, that codes any of your local music, whether you have an orchestra in your city like we do here in Milwaukee, uh, maybe it's a performer, a soloist. Um, maybe it's uh, somebody in your state. Uh, again, a nice way for me to go ahead and spread out those so that we don't clump them all together. Uh, so again, the attribute rules, this is really the, the, the place where you define your sound. And again, whether you automatically schedule or don't, I would still suggest you put in stuff like this. Because you don't need to remember when the last time was that you played a German work. Of course, you guys are so good, you would just look at it and know that. But still, there's no reason to use the brain power. Let the program do it, and then when you're looking for those replacement songs in the editor, it'll just tell you, and then you don't have to worry about it. Frankly, I just really don't want to remember when was the last time I played a harpsichord work, so I put the, I put the rule in the system. That's always the one that gets people because they usually don't remember that. All righty. So library maintenance, clocks, rules, it's all a prelude to get us to the schedule editor. And so I'm going to open up today's log. And I'm going to start right here at midnight. And what I want to show you right off the bat, I'm going to go to 1 AM and show you 2 AM as well. Here's my four pieces in the hour. Check out my total time, folks, 59.47, right in the middle of my timing frame. One, 59.22 gives, gives me, look at how no hours look the same. It's a B-I-C-E. It's an R-J-B-I. It's a C-E-A-D. That's what the migrating does for you. It's a little different every time, but it's still giving me what I want. It's also hitting my hour to time in. Now, in this particular case, couldn't find something. But check it out. I mean, it's um, like 27 minutes, 27 minutes or so that needs to fill the hour. So whether you automatically schedule or you just have your empty positions here, how do you go? What's the fastest way to fill these positions? Well, if you know what you want, I would suggest direct data entry. Because now you can say, Bach. Now I'm going to use the contains mode, which means it's dot dot what I want dot dot. Now when I press enter, yes, I'm going to get JS, but I'm also going to get CPE. Anything that's got BACH in it is going to come through. Now I'm going to close my info bar, giving me a little bit more screen real estate. And I can pull this over a little bit. You can see whatever it might be violating. And of course, because I know I need something really, really long. That's why it's violating that rule. But as long as I know what I'm looking for, direct data entry is terrific. So for instance, I can just come in here and do Mozart. Now I know it's going to violate artist separation because I've got one right there. But look how easy that is. Dot, dot, Mozart, dot, dot. And yes, do I get Leopold? Of course. But again, still very quick, comes up. And of course, it knows it violates the rule there. This can be done in other fields as well. Let's say you knew you wanted to, you got two romantics, an impression. Maybe you know you want a 20th century. Here's where having that code with the right letter that means something is really helpful. I know my musical period for 20th century is the capital letter T. I can just type it in. Off it goes, and it's going to pull up the 20th century music for me. And I'll see whatever thing, anything fails. I'll get all my rules. Um, but I can get to that 
that kind of music quickly. You can do the same thing for instrumentation. I don't have nationality showing here, but I could do it for that. Uh, so that's a real fast way to find what you're looking for. You can also use those saved queries. So if I right click, I can select Schedule Song, come down to Use the Saved Query, and there is that query that I made. So up pops the box, and now I can just type in Mozart. And that's going to give me the same list that I had before. So that may, may or may not be as fast as doing dot dot Mozart, but I can't do that with that runtime. And that runtime one is the one I really like for classical. I already knew I needed uh, about a 27-minute piece here. So I've got my query set up to say, well, what if I did 26 to say 2730? Show me everything in that range. And just like that, up on my screen pops all that work. And I've got mine set to the triple flag, which means I'm seeing everything, even if it violates the rules. If there's anything that, uh, if I don't want to do that, if I only want to see the stuff that passes the rules, I can click on the second flag, uh, and then those show up on my list. So these are all the works that don't violate any rules. It meets my timing, gets me where I need to be. I'd be in my 59 to 60, and I can pick whatever one I want. In it goes. So this is why I really want to encourage you to go make those queries uh, that will find, uh, use the prompted query, because you can now come in here, pull that up, and dig down and dial in right away. And you saw how quick I was able to find uh, the piece to fill that position in this hour. And again, you may remember from my clock that I actually don't allow the program to play two Bs back to back. But hey, I'm the one behind the keyboard right now. That's the piece I want to play. And I can certainly do that. There's one other option when you right click and go to schedule song. Uh, that's uh, cool. And that's song to fill the hour. So to demonstrate that one, I'm actually going to do Edit, Undo, which will take that song out of there. And I'm going to come back in and do Song to Fill the Hour. Now it knows in order to get to straight up 60 minutes in the hour, I need 2646. You'll notice that the operator is equals. I would suggest if you go this route, you change it to close to. Close to has a tolerance on either side of it. But like so many things in Music Master, that tolerance is actually changeable. So if I go ahead and run this, and we've already seen the kind of music it brings up, so I'm not going to do that. Uh, it would bring up everything from 26, uh, in my case, 2636 to 2656, because I've set my range to 10 seconds. Let me cancel this and show you that range. In other words, if you're looking for something to fill the hour, you probably are OK if it's got a little wiggle room on either side. So here we go, back to Tools and Options. And we'll go back again to Additional Properties. And this time we'll be in the Library section. There's an option called Close To. And so this is a tolerance again. So if you would be OK with something close to that's within 15 seconds on either side, we can go ahead and have you change that. Uh, and that's what a lot of the things do back here in the, in the Tools area. Uh, they basically let you uh, adjust the program to, to get it to, to be uh, a little more uh, to your liking so that you get what you want with less time and effort involved. So I can come in here and just change the uh, value of seconds that I want. So if I wanted 15 instead, the pro I just go ahead and put that in, and the program will automatically make that change when I use the close to in that query. Now, as long as I'm here, it's probably a good time. You know, I was doing direct data entry, and, and now I did the close to, and there's an option for that. It's probably a good idea to point out the replacement song options here. Uh, if you double click on a song, uh, here's direct data entry. Uh, all, here's the uh, insert. Uh, here's the runtime to fill an hour. All these things you can actually control what categories you pick. So again, your library is so big, why not make sure that we're, we're picking maybe some depth categories that you don't get to very often? So for instance, on direct data entry, I've actually told the program to only look at my top two categories, really. I mean, this is my high rotation and media rotation. So those are really just two categories split for time. And when I'm doing direct data entry, I only want to look at my two best categories. So those are the only ones that, that are looked at. None of these other categories on my list are up for consideration at that point. It's just those four. 
uh, you can go through and change any of these options here, depending on which ones you might use, so that you're picking whatever is best for you. Uh, again, this means that when you do that replacement option, you are more likely to get what you want right away, spend less time editing. So I'm going to go ahead and hit apply, and OK, and that will go, ahead, go away. Before we leave the schedule editor, I want to show you a couple of other things. And I need to get down here to the pictures in an exhibition. When I click on pictures in an exhibition, uh, and in fact, I would click on any of these selections, the, the results bar at the bottom of the screen would fill in. I, I picked pictures at an exhibition because it filled in all the things I want to show you. Uh, first of all, you want to change what you see. Right click anywhere in here, and you'll get customized. A lot of different options available. I'd suggest you, you pick them, look at them, see which ones may be helpful to you. Minimum rest, this is based off the title keyword field. I've set up my program, and we're going to go back to tools and options again. I've set up my program so that when the program does its testing, it looks at the title keyword times. Because if I have multiple versions of something, I don't actually want to know when was the last time I played that specific performance of pictures at an exhibition. I want to know the last time I played any performance of pictures at an exhibition. And that's what I've got going on here. So if I press F6 and look at the history graph, uh, you'll notice that the last time I played it was actually not this performance. Remember, the black square is the performance I'm looking at right now. So we know that was a different performance. How did I do that? Yep, we're going back to tools and options. So this time we're going to talk about the primary rest field. And the primary rest field is another one under additional properties. Oh, and I went past it, didn't I? It's under history. There it is. The primary rest field is the field that's used to do that controlling. So if I went to data set, library, fields, you'll see an ID number in the left column. That's the field ID number in Music Master. And in my database, my title keyword is field 105. So at that point, it's using that field to do that control. And so that rest function is going to sort by that field. And that gives me that number that we saw in that results panel. Now, in conjunction with that, I've also turned on primary rest rules. This is just an on-off. If it's not on, it'll say zero. Once you've turned it on, you turn it on by doing the number one there. And you use it with your primary rest field. And what that does is going to enable all of your history-based rules, like your minimum rest, your hour rotation, to use that linked song history. So in other words, when I'm looking at this particular piece by um, um, Zorsky, I'm seeing the minimum rest for the entire work, not that performance. And again, that I would think would be what you folks are looking for. You don't actually care about the specific performance. You might want to see the history graph, and you could certainly do that. But overall, when was the last time you played any version of pictures at an exhibition? Oh, OK, well, that was 37 days ago. And that's why we get that number. Now, you can see that the last time I played it in this exact same hour, 2 AM, was 155 days ago. And the last time it played in this particular shift uh, was 112 days ago. Uh, the shift rotations uh, can be set up by you to do what you, uh, to, to be whatever time frames you want. And then I also have the song rotation one in here. I love this little thing. I think it's totally cool. It's basically a miniature of the history graph. Uh, and so you can see the little dots for all the little plays, and you can see that uh, that's a good placement for that particular work. Hasn't played there for a while, and it's got nice separation from everything else. So the the toolbar down here, as the results bar, is giving you a lot of information in little short pieces uh, to help you understand what the program is doing and what all those pieces are doing in its rotation. And there's one final thing to show you here, uh, and that sort of give you the overall feel of your day. In my database. I want to be a station that primarily plays romantic and classical music, those two musical periods. And so I've set up instant analysis to help me monitor that. And it's done through this icon. And the first one you have here is our day analysis. I've set mine up for unscheduled positions so I can see where they are throughout my day. And the setup box is very similar to the one in instant analysis, so I'll just show you that one. So I've got five different things here. 
and I'm interested in not only seeing how many classical or romantic pieces I'm playing in an hour, but across the whole day. And I also want to see how my orchestral sound code is being used throughout the whole day. So let me open up these. You can see how I did this. I've picked it at the current day, picked my item, and I'm only testing against music. No non-music, none of that other stuff, just my song elements. You've got lots of different display options for uh, your choices here. So again, that's one you probably want to play around with to see what you want it to be. Gave it a label, but then here's the big trick. I actually gave it a high and low percentage. Uh, so if for whatever reason my day is outside of those parameters, it'll turn up in red for me when I display the panel. And the classical and the romantic look the same, aside from picking the different target and having different parameters, high and low. So once I have all these in here, I can close this, come to this icon, and trip off instant analysis. That box comes up on my screen, and you can see that orchestral is out of whack. Uh, it's, a, it's a little over, and romantic is over as well throughout, throughout the day. Uh, now that maybe helps me and informs me on how positions are filled during the day. If I have some positions that I have to fill, I can decide that these need to be I need to you know, shy away from some, ro some romantic pieces here, put in something else, shy away from something that's got that big sounding orchestra, uh, maybe get some solo work into the database. So it lets me see what the overall feel is. And coming up in just a minute, I'm going to actually show you how we can do this for an even longer amount of time, uh, over months and months and months, to see if you're getting there. Um, so instant analysis lets you target in whatever is really important to you. Uh, we have users use this for all different kinds of things. Uh, some formats are really interested in, you know, what, uh, what year the music was performed, and so they've got a setting to do that. Uh, our friends up in Canada do a lot of uh, governmental reports, and they have to meet their percentages, and so they use it for that. Uh, but no matter what's important to you, if you want to see what your overall looks like or an hour looks like, you can use instant analysis to see what that result would be. So having looked at library, clocks, rules, and the um, scheduler, I realized that I missed one quick thing back in the rule tree. It's kind of important, and so I want to go back and look at it. And what reminded me is when I was looking at that shift rotation analysis panel. When you're setting up your rules, make sure you pay attention to all the different checkboxes that you may have. Uh, and I bring up this one in particular because it really does have an impact for your format. First of all, test pass days only is very interesting. Um, you, you folks are the ones who, who will actually pre-schedule music into the future. And so you maybe have picked the 7 p.m. symphony that you're going to focus on next Thursday. You've already done that. So you actually have, although it sounds um, uh, unusual, you actually have future history. Uh, so when you're doing tests, it's important that you don't necessarily just test going backwards, you need to test going forwards as well. So that's a case where I wouldn't want to check this box off. And then also you've got a choice where you may want to cut the rule off, and that's what I'm doing here. Basically what I'm saying is, you know what, if you're going back to see when the last time something played and you've already gone back 99 days, don't worry about it anymore. Uh, that can be important, again, because your rotations are so long. Uh, so, you know, if 99 is the max that you can put there, you know, after three months if you don't care anymore, that's when you check that off. And that becomes important because the more history you're making the program go back to look through, uh, the longer it's going to take it to process, whether you're doing the automatic scheduler or you're looking for the replacement. So you want to make sure that you're not needlessly doing that if it's not important to you. So really take a look at your, your check boxes really closely depending on the rules that you've set up so that you're, you're testing what you need to test but not going back too far. And the, reason, the other reason I thought of this and wanted to come back is because it becomes very important when I show you data set, schedule, and purge history. Now, nothing bad happens when I open this up. What it does is it looks at what my active history is and what my archive history is. First, let me tell you, we do not delete history. I know this is a big thing for classical stations. It, it doesn't go away. We just archive it. All right, so you're not losing any history by archiving. All that means is that you're not going to be able to go to that date in the schedule editor and open it up and look at it. That's all it means. I'm going to show you in a moment how I'm going to actually do a history report from the very beginning of this year, January 1st, and it's all there. 
it's on the history graph. You can dig down and see it on the history graph. It's just not active. Uh, and that's very critical because, again, the more active history you have, the longer it takes for the program to do that automatic scheduler because it's got to look at, do all that for all your rules. Same with, you know, looking for that replacement song and looking for all those rules. So if you don't have any archive history, uh, that is something I would definitely recommend you set up. Um, check your number of days. 99, three months, probably all you need. Um, but again, you know, you, you know best how many days that you need to look at, whether it's going into the future, how many back, that kind of thing. Also, automatically purge when necessary. You want that to happen. So if you come in here and you make a change here, or you don't have the check mark here, and you check that off, this is one of those things where I don't want you to do it right away. I actually want you to go to Tools and Backup first, make a backup of your database, then come back in and make your changes. When you click OK, it's going to ask you if you want to purge. Go ahead and say yes, and then I want you to walk away. Let the program finish. Don't end task. Go to lunch. Go do your air shift. Walk away. Let it finish. After you do that, you uh, should see a noticeable improvement in speed if you've made a significant change there. Um, the other purge that I want to show you, again, is uh, one where you make a backup first, and then when you go to Tools and Purge, um, this one, fairly similar, not quite a, a perfect analogy to the old uh, computer doing defrag. Get rid of the space, condense it all down. Uh, when we release 4.0 SR16, uh, you'll actually get some more information at the bottom of your screen on what it's doing uh, and compacting, and it'll actually tell you how small, how much smaller it made it, what percentage. Uh, we did a database uh, just a couple of weeks ago where we ran purge, and it went from, I don't know, 50, 60, 70 megs, some re really high number, down to like five. Uh, it was just really bloated, and so we, we shrunk that database way down, and that database was super fast for the user after that. So if you haven't run tools in purge, uh, weren't familiar with what that was. Uh, again, your database is so large and you're adding a lot of stuff all the time that, it, you know, run tools and purge and again, walk away, let it run, go to lunch, do your air shift, come back, uh, and then after you do both of those, make a new backup uh, and then uh, hopefully those things will all run much faster for you. All right, so library clocks, rules, scheduler. The last thing I want to show you today uh, is in the history browser. Uh, and this goes back to showing you, um, you know, first of all, that all the history is there, uh, but we can do some sort of long-term kinds of things. So I'm going to go back to January 1st, and we're just going to do the first four months of the year, so I'll take it to the end of April. So I've just picked my dates here. I'm going to go in and, and take out stuff I know I'm not really playing. I'm not going to mess with the filters right now. I'm not going to sort of dig down and look at anything specific. I want to stay up a little bit as far as my level. And then I'm going to look at display. And the first thing I want to do is find out which composer I'm playing most often. Oh, yes, I know you already guessed it's Mozart, and you're right, but I just need to show it to you. <clears throat> so let me run the calculation here, and it'll come up, and yes, Mozart's on the top. Surprise, surprise. Um, but what I want to show you is really kind of interesting. Uh, it's Mozart, Haydn, Beethoven, Beethoven Dvorak, and Brahms. Now, why would you even come in here and do this? We all knew Mozart was going to come up on the top of the list. What's the point? Well, let me go back to library maintenance and show you something. I'm going to go ahead and put my info bar back up here for a second. And I'm going to pull up my entire library, go over to my composer field, and right-click and do library analysis. Now, Guess what? Mozart is on the top of the list. We're not surprised about that, are we? Mozart, Beethoven, Bach. But check it out. Vivaldi is number five. Brahms is down here about number ten. I can go back to my history browser. Brahms was five. But watch how far down I have to go before I get to Vivaldi. He's, he's um, what did I pass him? Well, he was 31 when I did this just a little bit ago. There he is, 27. He's 27th on the list. Now, that's not necessarily a good news or a bad news thing, but it's information, and information is power. If you think you should be playing Vivaldi more often, and you run the report and he comes in 27th when he's fifth in your database, remember I only did rotated music, so uh, those are the pieces that I'm rotating by Vivaldi, and I, you know, he comes up fifth on the list, but he comes up 27th in plays. If that's a problem, 
now you are empowered because now you can look at uh, maybe his composer separation time. Maybe you could call up all of his music on your database using one of those prompted queries and find out what kind of coding is on his music to see if maybe there's a rule that's impacting that. Um, the idea is, is that we, you know, not, no surprise that Mozart's on the top of the list, but you, when you start to look at the other composers, maybe something is going on that you didn't even realize that you're playing less of Vivaldi than you think you should. And that's where doing this over the long term allows you to see that. So where we were in analysis, instant analysis in the schedule editor, and we're just looking at that day, uh, we're only seeing just a short snapshot there. Here I'm looking at four months of information, January 1st to April 30th. Now, of course, in instant analysis, I did musical period. Now, I actually made that as a favorite. So when the favorites come up, I'll do musical period and load that up and go change my time period again so that we can see that same time frame that I just did beginning of the year through the end of April. Now remember, I told you I was a classical romantic kind of station. Let's see what I come up with. Does the calculations. By the way, if you're ever wondering what's going on while the hourglass is on, just watch the bottom left-hand corner of your screen. So there it is, romantic and classical. Those are the top two spin getters. And I've changed my graph down here to airtime density just so that I can show you that, okay, just about 40%. 36%, so give or take, 75% of the time when you listen to my station, it's either romantic or classical. Again, that's power, that's knowledge. Uh, if that's not what I'm trying to do, I know I have a problem. If that is what I'm trying to do, that's validation of the way I'm programming on just a day-to-day -day level. So it's sometimes great to use the history browser to come back and make sure that overall you're getting what you want. It does a couple of other things for you as well. Certainly if you have something that's undefined, it'll let you know that. So you can go back and fix those things. Uh, I'm just going to show you really quick the other one I have in here because you're probably wondering, well, we know which composer she played the off most often. What about orchestra? Uh, it's not going to be what you think, um, uh, but it turns out it's okay in my database because the one at the top of my list is, in fact, the orchestra that, or the ensemble, I should say, uh, that I have the most of in my database. It is the Academy of St. Martin in the Fields. And if I did library analysis, uh, you would see that that one has the most performances in my database. So fairly um, uh, obvious there on that one. Uh, and you see the other big ones. I mean, no surprise here, English, Orpheus of London and Berlin. Nothing really shocking in any of those things. Uh, but it's kind of fun every once in a while to do that and see what you're playing more of uh, in case maybe you don't want to be. So the history browser can really come in handy uh, for doing those kinds of things. So we've looked at the rule tree, we've looked at the scheduler, history browser, clocks, library. We've crawled all over the software. I hope you have found great tips and tricks that you can use in your database today. I just want you to remember, it's not cut and dried. I want you to remember to think in terms of scale. So whether that's the composer and having two different separation times in that rule tree, a floor, and where you'd really like to have it, or platooning pieces, deciding which number or some subset of the whole you're going to move in and out of your database. Maybe it's the capabilities of our timing to get you to that time point that you need so you have to do less work. Setting up those prompted queries so you can dial into the specific pieces you want to see in the editor. It's all about telling Music Master what's important to you so the program can help you make your station sound great. My name is Jill Sorensen. I'm the Product Support Manager here at Music Master. Thank you so much for uh, sticking with us through uh, our presentation today. Coming up next week, we'll have another webinar. Uh, it will be uh, Tech Talk. So if you have technical people in your building, uh, we are going to do one specifically for them. This presentation will be up on our website, as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, a little later this afternoon for you to watch again or to have other people in your building watch again. If you have any questions about what you saw or need things added to your database to do the things that you saw, please contact your Music Master Scheduling Consultant directly so they can help you. Uh, if you don't have a support plan, go ahead and uh, let me know. I'm jill at mmwin.com is the email address, and we will see what we can do to get you taken care of. Uh, or you can always email support at mmwin.com. Thank you very much, and have a terrific day.